episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today on another really fascinating set of topics, uh, all endeavoring and helping to make a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor to be joined by Dr. Clarice Aiello, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, at UCLA Samueli School of Engineering, as well as the leader of their new quantum biology technology group or qubit. Uh, with her PhD uh, from MIT in electrical engineering and postdoc appointments uh, in bioengineering at Stanford and in chemistry at Berkeley, uh, her research group, the Quantum Biology Tech Lab, is ultimately focused on performing quantum measurements on so-called living sensors, including protein cells, microorganisms, ultimately understanding uh, how they interact with their environment so elegantly, so precisely. Uh, and this knowledge, uh, you know, as mentioned, can lead to a range of future discoveries for humanity uh, in understanding uh, not just how, uh, say, animals navigate, uh, but also advanced therapeutics for uh, various forms of diseases, quantum computing, quantum information strategies, uh, a lot of really cool ideas and tech potentially coming down the road as a result of this work. Uh, and we're lucky to have her with us today. So, uh, Dr. Clarice Aiello, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you for having me here. It's, I'm super thrilled. Yeah, it's super thrilled to have you. Uh, and um, of course, you know, as we typically do, um, I, I'm going to start off by sort of handing you things for a little bit, just to uh, introduce yourself a little further, talk a little bit more about your background, everything from where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in engineering and physics, and then ultimately, what got you interested in some of these more, what I'll, I'll call esoteric themes of quantum dots and photonic structures and, and everything else you're going to be talking about today. Awesome. So the first thing you need to know about me is that I am um, Brazilian. I um, lived in Brazil until I was uh, almost 20 years old when I got a scholarship to study in France. So I spent uh, about five years in Europe uh, doing my undergraduate uh, at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and then a master uh, thesis in uh, the University of Cambridge. After that, I crossed the Atlantic back to the Americas, but uh, to North America, and I came to the US to do my PhD and to do uh, some more postdoctoral research. And now since 2019, I'm a faculty at UCLA. So I, I, I build instruments and I started my group in November of 2019, which is not a very good time to start if you build experiments, right? Because two months later, we were all sent back home. Yep. Um, but I like to call myself a quantum engineer. And that means that I built apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. Um, it can actually be proven with mathematical arguments that if you use a quantum object, say one electron or a, a couple of electrons, if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, uh, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. And uh, in my past, I uh, then worked with uh, so-called technological quantum sensors. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, people are developing now technological uh, quantum systems to be, uh, to be put to work as very sensitive uh, magnetic field sensors, electric field sensors, uh, temperature sensors, and uh, the field already has uh, uh, very real implications. So there are big companies who are actually putting uh, electron uh, sensors to, to, to look for oil in the soil. Uh, people are measure, trying to measure temperature inside cells using those quantum sensors, right? So, so quantum sensing, as it, the field is named, is a thing, it's already starting to, uh, to influence our lives a big time. It turns hey, hey, out, yeah, yes, go for it. No, go please, for, please, no, no, continue. Oh I'm, my uh, God, because I'm going to, 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 to make the, the bridge to quantum bio. Please. Um, 
there's incomplete but convincing evidence that uh, quantum things inside a biomatter uh, are for a short time working pretty much as a bona fide quantum sensor, mm -hmm. right? This means that there are things, say, inside proteins, say, electrons inside proteins that are, or, or, in, other or in, in another way, like nature seems to be taking advantage of quantum properties in order for living things to interact with their environment. Uh, what uh, the, the, the people who uh, study the ways in which nature uh, might be using quantum mechanics to function optimally uh, are, I don't think they, they call themselves that, but, but they are quantum biologists, mm -hmm. people who are interested in, in quantum phenomena in biology. And uh, quantum biology is an emerging uh, field and uh, an interdisciplinary field. Uh, practitioners come, uh, they, they come from backgrounds as varied as biology, physics, uh, chemistry, uh, molecular uh, uh, MDs or doctors who want to study like molecular mechanisms of, of disease. And this is now uh, the field that I'm in. Uh, I, I'm, I'm taking my experience with technological quantum sensors and I'm, I'm basically building machines, misusing machines made to study and control technological quantum sensors and try and, and with those machines, I want to, in a very high tech way, study and control those, what I'm tentatively calling living quantum sensors. And thinking about that, and I mentioned some of the um, potential applications or different fields of study in the introduction. And, and, you know, when I've sort of delved into this area a little bit in the past, um, whether we're talking about um, the efficiency of something like photosynthesis versus right. a solar panel, uh, how the little birds outside can fly hundreds of miles and know exactly right. where they're going. Uh, the one that I like the most, because I, you know, I come out of the pharma industry is, you know, I got 50 trillion cells here and somehow everything perfectly happens right. for the most part right. every day of my life. Um, and, and sort of the balance, um, and, and sort of one way is question where I'm having this conversation at a cocktail party, or whatever, so someone says, why <laughs> quantum biology? Uh, and I'll say, well, the, the general concept that, oh, it's all sort of, you know, random and by accident that it works so perfectly, the lock and key model. No, not precisely. This is why we have to delve into. Um, talk just a little bit, when, when we're talking about these living sensors, Yep. Uh, it's a little different than sort of what we study in pharmacology that here is, you know, a ligand and something binding with it. Here we're dealing, as we know from the quantum world, that things are not always in one place. They vibrate. There's waves and not particles. Talk a little bit about this aspect of sort of uh, the living sensor and what the living sensor is actually sensing potentially in the quantum biologic world. Yes. The first thing that I, I do need to tell you is that uh, I don't think there is right now any uh, uh, experiment that proves unambiguously uh, that nature is um, using quantum mechanics to function. Let me tell you a little bit about the evidence that exists there for the, the different flavors of quantum mm -hmm. biology Please. in general. Uh, first of all, um, I, I think that there's a lot of evidence uh, at chemical lens scales, say for proteins in solution, for proteins in a vial, that thinks that quantum phenomena might be, uh, that quantum phenomena are sustained by those, say, proteins, whatever, right? So in uh, controlled chemical systems, in a chemist's lab, things are for sure happening in a quantum way, even at room temperature. Yeah. The problem is that the next lens scales of, of uh, available uh, evidence uh, exists for say, plates of thousands of cells, whole organisms, say whole birds, whole flies. And the results that people get with behavioral experiments, which are very, very difficult, right? To, mm -hmm. to, to get done. The results that people are getting, most of those are consistent with a uh, quantum model underlying what's happening, right? 
but it's very hard to say, well, the fly is doing X because there's a quantum process occurring sure. inside it. So uh, there needs to be some, si some type of landscape bridging, right? Uh, such an experiment has not been done. And well, th that's, that's what we're, we're gearing up for. But um, I think that in order for quantum biology to start becoming more mainstream and, and hopefully to start becoming fundable by mainstream uh, uh, grant granting uh, agencies, mm -hmm. th there needs to be an experiment that correlates at a, a small scale, at cellular scales, quantum phenomena and physiological workings. And if possible, how tweaking those endogenous quantum mechanical degrees of freedom might directly and, and visibly affect mm -hmm. uh, downstream process, right? So, so let me uh, give you some examples of where nature might be using quantum mechanics to function. There are different flavors of quantum biology. So uh, I study uh, the, the, the quantum biology flavor that uh, is based on spin. Okay. Spin is a uh, merely quantum mechanical property that quantum objects have, and spin is as fundamental as mass and charge. For example, electrons have spin, uh, atomic nuclei have spin, mm -hmm. and spin measures how well uh, a, a quantum object interact with um, magnetic fields, with external magnetic fields, right? So uh, the spin, the, uh, um, a quantum object like an electron will have different associated uh, spin energies, sure. depend, depending on, on like, it, it, depending on, on this quantum property, right? So uh, physicists and engineers uh, and chemists usually depict uh, spin, you might have seen it uh, with an arrow, say arrow up depicts uh, one energy state of this electron spin and arrow down represents the other uh, energy state of, of this uh, okay. spin quantum property. And uh, basically, uh, <laughs> to cut a long story short, um, external magnetic fields might influence if a spin has the up energy or the spin down energy, right? So magnetic fields uh, can sort of shift those quantum properties mm -hmm. inside those electrons, for example. Now, it's known from basic chemistry. It has been known for many decades. There is no whatsoever doubt about the fact that some chemical reactions are spin dependent. Okay. That is, uh, there's a chemical reaction reaction happening and at some point it comes to, to an injunction and uh, depending on the spin state of a certain electron, say if the electron spin is up, a certain electron spin is up, the chemical reaction continues through one branch if the electron spin is down, the chemical reaction continues through another branch. Importantly, the macroscopic final products of those two branches are different. Okay, okay. so a very uh, finicky quantum process of a magnetic field interfering with the spin to, to, to influence whether it's more probable to be up or down which is per se a, a relatively fast a process occurring between nanoseconds to microseconds. This very quick interaction uh, with, the, with external magnetic fields that change the, that can change spin states, that very quick interaction might have macroscopic consequences because mm -hmm. it alters the final products of, of chemical reaction and at much, much longer time scales because it's like it happens downstream mm -hmm. right so it's uh in this sense that uh that the quantum property of spin might be uh, interfering uh with the things in living systems and this whole flavor of quantum biology started historically because of birds and um it's known without uh again any doubt 
that birds do use the tiny magnetic field of the earth to migrate, mm -hmm. at least as a partial cue. And the magnetic field of the earth is like crazy tiny. It's like mm -hmm. uh, tinier than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to your right. face. So how, how might they be doing this? And the idea is that birds might be, and organisms in general, might be sensing or interacting with magnetic fields to the extent that they can sense different physiological concentrations of products mm -hmm. coming from these spin-dependent chemical reactions, right? I'm following you. And uh, this whole shebang started with birds mm -hmm. uh, and uh, bird migration is the poster child of spin-based quantum biology. But recently it has been realized that sensing and interaction with magnetic fields uh, in meaningful ways might be much, much more widespread in biology than studied mm. so far. Uh, again, there's evidence like, in, in, for example, for thousands of cells that tiny magnetic fields um, change metabolic reactions in big ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the coolest evidence that I have is um, from an experiment performed by a, a physicist friend in Munich. Uh, his name is um, Peter Fierlinger, and he's like a, a precision measurement physicist. He's like a bona fide physicist. And for mm -hmm. a living, what he does is he builds hypomagnetic chambers. That is, he builds very good Faraday cages, okay. boxes that shield external magnetic fields yep. very, very well. And he started hearing about those magnetic field effects in biology. So uh, what he did, and now this apparently has been reproduced in two other groups that also have like those hypomagnetic chambers. He grew uh, tadpoles, uh, frog embryos inside those hypomagnetic chambers for yep. two days, which was as long as he could go without asking for a bio permit or something, under two conditions. Uh, in one condition, uh, the tadpoles were uh, grown just under this the, the noise magnetic field inside the chamber, which was about nanotesla, that is even smaller mm -hmm. than the 50 microtesla of magnetic field of the Earth, which was already very, very tiny, right? And in the other condition, uh, they grew the tadpoles under um, like an extra applied field inside the hypermagnetic chamber of strands close to the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, the tadpoles grown under the mimicked uh, Earth field inside were macroscopically okay when they looked at the plate, whereas the tadpoles grown under the, the nanotesla field, about 30% of them were like macroscopically deformed, mm. which is crazy if you think about yep. it. I mean, this does not prove that it's spin dependent, but given the, the strength of the fields involved and the fact that you didn't even need to, to give magnetic fields, you took mm -hmm. out a tiny magnetic field and you created havoc in, 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 in this embryo developments, right? Yep. And I think that everyone's best bet is that this is spin based and and this has opened up all sorts of questions, right? From, from you know, space exploration. That's, what's the magnetic field in Mars? Can we mm -hmm. grow tomatoes in Mars? Can we reproduce in Mars? To something like, um, it, well, right now it's, it's science fiction, but maybe not in five years, not in 10 years, but in, in 50 years. Will we understand enough how electromagnetic fields play a role in biology so that we can predictably apply magnetic fields to, to sort of drive biological spin-dependent chemical reactions in biology towards getting to a certain metabolic outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I, I, a couple, well, several months ago, I had um, uh, Mike Levin on the show from Tufts yes. talking about, you know, uh, he deals with those of the bioelectric fields and this yes. nature. And, and obviously this is, this is a little different, um, and you know it's, he's you know focused on a lot of the ion channels and so forth yeah. on cells. Um, in, in this particular case, and, and once again, please forgive me because I my, my homework that I did before this was to go into as much I could find and sort of <laughs> and process it at, at a you know a third grade level here. But uh, terms and once again, okay. So you you know as you were saying. Um, and it's at the qubit site sort of, you know, one of your main things is, you know, can we prove or not, or, 
a refute that spin physics is involved in this stuff and, and, and mm -hmm. capable of manipulating uh, biology and, and potentially a therapeutic advantage. What, and, and uh, this, I guess this is more of the science fiction science term, but what is, um, in your opinion, uh, sort of the, uh, the receiver, the gateway, what, the portal, whatever you want to call it, uh, on the other, uh, the other side of that? Because I've seen things, once again, in the literature that I just like briefly right. looked at things like uh, so gel solution transitions. I've seen things about coherent supermolecules. Uh, there's this thing called the Zeeman interaction uh, and splitting spectrum lines in magnetic fields. A lot of stuff that probably 10 people in the world understand. Um, talk a little bit about sort of the, the receiver of, of, of you know, on the other end of the, sort of that magnetic field. And when you, when you get into this, well, what are we looking at there? Does it have to do with water? Does it have, so to introduce some of the thoughts on that front. It, it has to do, that, that's a, a tough question. Let me see how, how I'm going to, to answer it. Take your time. It has to do with unusual quantum effects. Okay. Okay, so, so let, me, let me talk you through several degrees of quantum, if you okay. will. Okay, please. Uh, quantum mechanics describes uh, things very, describes well things that are very small mm -hmm. right so one electron a couple of, of electrons a couple of, of molecules so uh, at the very basic say quantum zero level everything's quantum because mm -hmm. everything is built out of quantum blocks mm -hmm. okay so that's the the very basic level okay but that's not enough uh, in, in my in this definition for for each to for life to constitute for life to be using quantum mechanics to work so everything sure. is quantum but uh, there are some a, a couple of, of of levels above this sure the first level above this that I'm some people call it like quantum one or quantum 1.0 okay. has to do with one single quantum object using a property called superposition. Okay, yep. Some people might have heard it. It's like a buzzword and it refers to a quantum object being able to occupy different positions and occupy different energy states at the same time, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, and, and actually this uh, superposition uh, property is one property that might give quantum computers an edge over classical computers. Mm -hmm. Quantum computers might be our machines that are being developed that might function, that might be able to solve things that classical computers cannot. Mm -hmm. uh, in your classical computer, all the information is encoded in bits, zeros and ones, right? Mm -hmm. And those bits are encoded, for example, in two different voltage levels, say, uh, if you're sending a signal with, with, with like, with, a, with an amplitude of zero volt, that might encode, doesn't matter, qubit one. And if you send a signal with five volts of, like, of, of amplitude, that might, might encode the, the other, like, might encode the bit zero, right? Mm -hmm. And by sending, voltage spikes and differences in, in voltages, you can create sort of a message. Well, a quantum bit is a bit that can occupy the energy of the zero volt and the energy of the five volt at the same time. Yep. I mentioned that um, spins, say, uh, when people say spin up, it means like, a certain energy level of the spring property and spin down, like arrow down, as people describe qubits, might mean another uh, energy level of this quantum property called spin. The interesting thing is that quantum bits, and I'm saying that electron spins, for example, constitute a quantum bit, a two-level system of different energies. A electron can have, at the same time, the electron up and the electron spin mm -hmm. down energy, right? So this is called a superposition uh, state. The, the this possibility of uh, quantum objects being in two different energy levels at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
this level of uh, 1.0 in, um, in, in quantum 1.0 uh, is the level that is uh, minimally explored by technological quantum sensors. The minimal technological quantum sensor that you can have needs to, to be able to be kept in a superposition state. Okay. So uh, the types of quantum biology flavor that I'm most interested in also only requires this quantum 1.0 level. Okay. okay. And uh, right now, that's the level that I'm convinced that nature explores. Gotcha. Okay. I, 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 I bet I, I'm betting my research career in that nature is indeed exploring this 1.0. Level. Now, about uh, above this level, there is quantum 2.0, okay. which has to do with uh, the property of entanglement. Yep. Entanglement, another buzzword, is a, 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 a an interaction that is characteristic of, of two or more quantum objects. Whereas superposition was uh, the property of one quantum system. Entanglement needs two or more quantum systems. So it's, it's more complex, right? And entanglement means that um, if you know something about uh, one object, you might immediately know uh, something about another object in mm -hmm. the following way. Here is a crappy analogy. It's not perfectly good, but, but it's an analogy, right? Imagine that um, I... I meet you at uh, UCLA and I, I, I carry two different bags and I tell you, well, uh, inside each one of these bags, like inside one of them, there's a green ball and inside the other of them, there's a red ball. Take one, right? And you take one home very far away from uh, UCLA. At the moment when in your home, far from, from the bag that remained with me, at the moment that you open this ball and you see that there's a green ball you open this bag and you find that there is a green ball inside it, you immediately know that I have the, the, the bag with the, with the red ball, right? And it's in this sense that entanglement goes. Knowing something about your bag, your ball, you immediately know something about the bag that remained with me very, very far away. This mm -hmm. is, I mean, entanglement is absolutely proven in technological quantum systems. Sure. There's nothing spooky or, or, or causality breaking. It's, it's all good, right? right? And uh, entanglement, uh, quantum computers nowadays uh, to, to function need to have, to have entanglement. Entanglement, uh, some people uh, study entanglement in biology. At this point, I am not convinced that, that nature is using entanglement because uh, you might imagine uh, entanglement is, is much more fragile than, than say, than, superpo than superposition, right? Mm -hmm. And the important thing is that everything that starts quantum dies classical. And that's okay. sort of why we live in a classical world. This means that uh, as small quantum objects start interacting with themselves, they start colliding in unpredictable ways, uh, losing energy and, and like inserting irreversible interactions uh, in the system. So what happens is that when a lot of quantum objects start interacting, uh, they, they all, they're all, brought back to classicality yep. and uh, and this is why we actually live end up living in, in our big world uh, quantum interactions are basically quenched right so it's very special yeah. to have quantum interactions and this is why some people find it weird that nature might be sustaining for a short time uh, quantum interactions that might be making uh, like might be physiologically relevant but there's evidence towards that what uh you mentioned that okay so in 2019 you organized the uh, the qubit 
lab. Obviously, we boom, ran into the uh, pandemic. But um, <laughs> yes. just sort of walk us through a little bit on what, you know, yes. if we were to w- hang around and do a tour, what, what do we find there? Because I, I, I can envision the, you know, the most technologically advanced stuff one can envision. But please, uh, okay. Farrah. Right, right now, you find boxes. That's cool. What's inside those boxes are other cool things like Faraday cages and other stuff. Yes, right. and and mirrors on the table. So, what uh, we're gearing up towards to is like bridging those land scales uh, where current experiments in in spin quantum biology exist. Right, right now, there's evidence for spin quantum biology in in, in vials in glass vials. And there's consistent evidence coming from behavioral experiments with like birds, right? So what we want to do is try at the same time to see a spin phenomenon in action and how it um, translates downstream into uh, physiological signatures. Let let me explain what this means. This means that we are uh, building like really developing in-house glorified microscopes with coils. So uh, coils uh, produce magnetic fields and we need magnetic fields to um, sort of try to to influence those chemical reactions that depend on spin because magnetic fields might alter spin states. Okay. okay, so that's what the coils are for. And of course, we, we have planned to put like a, a Faraday cage around, around this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the microscope part is to be able to look at those things, you know, from the bottom up. We want to be able to, to start looking, say, at, at a single cell, and maybe at some point, a couple of cells, like tissue level, but we mm-hmm. really need to start small. We want to, at the same time, measure uh, under a microscope, spin signatures and uh, physiological signatures that might depend on spin. And the way that we do this is uh, via a fluorescence. Okay. So first of all, uh, it is regular cellular process in biology. Many of those can be uh, studied under, under fluorescence microscopy, which means that you put inside your cell something called a fluorescence marker Mm -hmm. and a fluorescence marker a fluorescence molecule is a molecule that when it gets light from a microscope it gets excited and then uh, as it de-excites it it emits light and this light in this molecule is known as the fluorescence of that molecule right and then um, some molecules might fluoresce less or more depending on some cellular parameters. And that's how we look at the cellular downstream thing. But we also want to look at spin signatures like at the same time. And that's the cool thing that hasn't been explored yet. Uh, In the technological quantum sensor that I worked with in my past, maybe one or, or, or another person listening to this podcast will know. This technological quantum sensor that I worked with is like a very high sensor. It's called a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. It's like a, an electron spin in diamond that works very well as a magnetic field sensor. Mm. And it was very interesting because um, if you shone light at this thing in diamond, uh, it got excited. It was a fluorescence type of thing. It got excited. And then as it excited, it emitted light, fluorescence light. Okay. But here's the catch. And that's the important thing. It emitted a different fluorescence intensity. If the, the spin sensor had one energy was up or had the other energy was down. So just by looking at how strongly the thing that you were looking at was was emitting light in your computer just by comparing light intensities you could make you could infer the spin state of that technological quantum sensor mm. okay so this exists uh, for those who are trained in this this is called optically detected magnetic resonance it's not important at all but the idea is that many of 
those uh, proteins that sustain spin-dependent chemical reactions in biology, mm -hmm. they also have the same property. They're fluorescent proteins. And when they are excited by light, they get excited. When they excite, they emit light, they fluoresce, but they fluoresce at different mean intensities. They send mm -hmm. light at different mean intensities if that particular electron spin that we care, the particular sensor has one energy or the other. So in our microscopes, we're gearing up to be able to correlate those two fluorescent processes, the, the, the spin signature and the cellular signature from usual uh, fluorescence microscopy in biology, right? This has never been done. We need, I, I think that what's needed in, at least in spin quantum biology is to be able to see spin phenomena and cellular phenomena at the same time. And what we want is apply magnetic fields to, to, to tweak the spin phenomena, be able to measure that we're tweaking the spin via differences in fluorescence mm -hmm. intensity and how this tweaking influences things downstream. When you were, um, when you were working at Berkeley, um, I, I just came to mind because I, I have some notes here. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a, I came across a presentation by, uh, from Dr. Luke Lee um, at cool. Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, and I think some of this, this is now resonating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> resonance energy transfer, I think. Um, yes. But you started talking about some of these quantum nanoscopes and things like that. And, and I, at the time, I was like, wow, that sounds cool. But now, okay, this is all now, okay, making sense that, uh, that you're uh, beginning to realize uh, some of this potential. Um, what obviously I know it's, it's early on, but are there uh, biologic systems? Well, as especially as it pertains to the human condition, um, human health, and so forth, disease uh, that you're most interested in. Uh, are you interested in the CNS? Uh, are you interested in cardiovascular health? What, what are some of the things? Obviously, you have you know you have to look out a bit. But what are the you know once you prove this, well, and you're going to succeed. Uh, what, what are you really going to start looking at in terms of human health and, and, and the applications of some of this potentially to? Uh... So, so, so the, the first thing to say is like, even if so, so uh, uh, again, as sometimes I mentioned in my talks, I, I, I want to unambiguously prove or refute Understood. whether spin spin makes a difference. Right? I'm pretending you already, you already proved that it's no, no, 2025 no, 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 now. No no, 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 but even if we prove that it doesn't make a difference, it, it's still very relevant because yep. then people will need to, to, to change their models to explain things that exactly. can now only be explained by a, a spin consistent model. Yes. So, um, and, and when you talk about, well, CNS and, and vascular stuff, I, I look at much, much more Small, much smaller length scales, sure. right? Um, I am interested in, for example, uh, redox biology, sure. the biology of electron transfers, like things being, charges being moved one way or the other. Yep. For example, the production of reactive oxygen species. So reactive oxygen species are like uh, radicals. Uh, they, they get a bad rep. Sure. They're, they're, as far as I understand, I'm not a biologist, they're very useful for signaling. They, they send signals around your body, but, but if you have uh, too much of them, things get bad, bad, right? And that's why some people say, well, you have to take anti antioxidants. I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether they're good or bad in the end, but, but that, that's the idea. So um, react the production of reactive oxygen species seems to be regulated by magnetic fields in a spin consistent way. That is the present evidence, again, at those limited length scales, the present evidence indicates that one can control reactive oxygen species levels by just tweaking external magnetic fields, mm -hmm. weak magnetic fields. Uh, but by the way, the magnetic fields uh, that I'm concerned with that influence from birds to metabolic processes, according to this, these spin-dependent chemical reactions, those magnetic fields are small, okay? This is a predominantly small magnetic field phenomenon. That is, it doesn't happen inside a big 
magnetic resonance imager, right? And it makes uh, it all the way more relevant because we're surrounded by things that emit low levels of, of radiation and, and right. And so in, in any case, um, just to say that weak magnetic fields are important. And um, so weak magnetic fields regulate uh, the production of reactive ocean species, mm -hmm. the yield of DNA repair in your cells. Um, weak magnetic fields uh, were shown to regulate uh, glycolysis rates, respiration rates inside cells, all in ways that are consistent with, with with they being driven by a quantum phenomena involving these electron properties of spin. It's, 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 it's in many, many places. It's crazy. It's fascinating. Beyond birds. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's truly fascinating. Um, once, you know, once, again, once you get the boxes unpacked, everything set up, um, <laughs> yes. what are, are you... Um, are you hiring? What's what's sort of the next step for the? I mean, if the pandemic oh, yes, went away we're, tomorrow, we're, what's what's happening? Say in twenty twenty two. Any any? I yeah. I, I, I always say is what what's hot happening in twenty twenty two. I don't know exactly what it is, but go ahead and tell us what's going to be happening <laughs> now that things are. I'm, I'm talking to your audience now. Yes, I'm hiring. Good. So um, we uh, we already have like an interdisciplinary set of people mm -hmm. working on on things, and th that's the cool thing about working in a in an interdisciplinary yep. field right it's it's a bit like no man's land no one's land because the, like physicists uh, they're used to like technological quantum things then sometimes yep. they won't even want to engage like they, they say well you're crazy this is it, it, it's frustrating it's frustrating and biologists they they tell me well we've been doing things chemically for like decades why yeah. do you need electromagnetic fields now so so it, it's hard right uh, but i find it fascinating because I, i'm learning all the time i nobody in this field can be an expert on everything uh, so i'm learning all the time i i work i i really think it's it's a field where the best like the people need to work together to get something done mm -hmm. the other thing i wanted to mention and and like and that's that's a bad thing. Like quantum biology is eminently a, a, a aging field, if you want, in that right now there's very little incentives for early career researchers to, to get into this field, right? Uh, usually people pivot to quantum to doing quantum biology inspired experiments in the last third, second half of their careers when they are well established when they have like a established stream of funding right so it's very hard for there to be uh, to recruit young talent right to run a group or to to, to engage as a phd student or 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 a researcher mm -hmm. right so and this has to to change right? in my view that this needs to to change and i think this will change uh, the moment that quantum biology becomes fundable by mainstream like funding agencies right but, but it's 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 a danger like things need to to get done and uh, uh, the, the other thing that I'm engaged in um, we got some um, some funds to do community building in mm -hmm. quantum biology mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm director of the first US based uh, quantum biology center run mm -hmm. out of UCLA we have uh, a bit of funding from uh, the National Science Foundation from the Kavli the Moore and the IDOR foundations. And the, the, the goal of this center is really to, is primarily, it's not, not to, to fund research yet, but it's primarily to bring people together. We have funds for, for conferences, for, uh, for little scientific exchanges, mm -hmm. because we need to, to, to spread the word that, well, quantum biology is a thing. Uh, Right when done properly, mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 less new agey than some people would have liked. Uh, but like, if if you Google like uh, quantum biology, like in my in my computer, H number thirteen is something related to, like quantum healing. So and and and, and this is very frustrating. Yeah, too, a lot of people use the term. Yes, 
and it, in the end quantum healing is what i want to do like in 50 years but right. but that's completely science fiction at this point right. well it's you know it, it's great that you're leading the charge here and you know as we spoke before i i had the opportunity to speak to uh, to Dr. McFadden out of uh, yes. the UK. Uh, I'm glad to see someone like you heading this up, uh, really in this uh, very, you know, we'll call it embryonic, but I mean, it offers so it, much is, yeah. p- potential uh, in this in this domain. So it's exciting, and 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 just really yeah. glad to see you leading the charge and and, and rooting you on with it uh, as you continue to go. And and we will definitely. Thank you. And, know, and thanks for 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 realizing that and for for giving me the opportunity to talk in your show about this yeah i mean as i said i, I apologize beforehand that you know this is one of those areas that <laughs> I, I, I i used to try to do my homework before the show but this is one no, that you but know it's it, my job it's, it's my lot, job yeah. to explain to 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 to, to society yeah. what, what quantum biology might be yeah it, it but it's absolutely fascinating and, and really you know rooting you on and, and, and helping yeah. you spread the word um, uh, for everybody uh, that's going to be listening to this episode uh, on the podcasts or watching on the YouTube channel. You've been spending time with Dr. Clarice Aiello, assistant professor, electrical and computer engineering at UCLA Samueli School of Engineering, uh, as well as leader of the new quantum biology tech group or Qubit. Um, Clarice, uh, once again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Um, obviously, thank you for everything you're doing to move this area forward. And as we say on this show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow because clearly what you're doing will create a fascinating tomorrow for all of us. So really, thank you. Thank you for having me.